course, my name is, is Matt Birdwistle. Um I'm a trustee of F&D Hope UK. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be with you here this evening in the UK um, and to welcome uh, Dr. John Stone. So, John, over to you. Hello. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, great pleasure to be here and um, particularly today, um, International FND Awareness Day. Have I said that right? You have. It's a mouthful. <laughs> Um, so, I'm, well, I'm waiting for questions, am I? Or do you want, no, do you want me to no, introduce no, myself? What, I, what I'd like to do, just, just to begin, to break everybody in nice yeah. and gently, um, the last 12 months has, has been, I think, quite momentous in the F&D community, uh, certainly in terms of increasing awareness, but particularly with increasing awareness within the profession of neurology. Um, I think evidence of that was the, uh, the seminar uh, the conference that you actually put together last year in, in Edinburgh, uh, where you had over 500 people uh, attend that. Um, so, so what's your view of the last 12 months? Yeah, I, I definitely sense uh, increasing momentum behind the uh, condition and interest in it. I sense, uh, I think you're right, the, the, you know, we were really pleased with the conference because we had hoped for a couple of hundred 300 if we were lucky. Um, I was quite worried. We booked the assembly rooms in Edinburgh. That's a big venue and uh, thought perhaps we're being a bit ambitious and we, we more or less filled it up with over 500 people, delegates from around the world who you know, paid, paid to be there. So um, it was fantastic and, and also amazing to hear of services springing up all over the world. Um, I think all continents represented, apart from uh, Antarctica, um, and yeah, and, and also a great sort of multidisciplinary feel to the event as well. This is an, uh, a condition that is not owned by um, anyone, not owned by neurology, psychiatry, psychology, but had physios, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists. We had 120 scientific posters. Um, so yeah, really exciting. No, that's that's good, um, and I think it's it's helpful um, for for patients to understand that, as you just said, the fact that there were so many people coming together, uh, the yeah. multidisciplinary side of things, and as you said, that you know FND doesn't fit under; it's not owned by one particular yeah. um, uh, profession. Which is which is kind of hard for for most people to to initially get their heads around. But how how do you how do you portray that now to people? You know, to, to new patients, people who've just been recently diagnosed with FND. Um, yeah. How do you say to them? You know, this is the, the sort of care that you're going to expect to to get better. Well, I think patients go through a journey, don't they? Often, and I think neurology is is and should be the first port of call. For many patients, although you know, there are other there are uh, specialists in other uh, you know, practitioners in other specialties who are capable of ma making this diagnosis, it normally requires a neurologist. So I suppose you could say that neurology is the st is the starting point for many patients, and for many, I think patients they should stay within neurology, whoever else they're seeing. I I think there's been a problem in the past in that neurologists have tended to make this diagnosis or make no diagnosis and then pass the patient, pass patients on to other health professionals um, and i see that changing in a way that i think should be encouraged that that, that neurologists see themselves as um, making a diagnosis but also initiating treatment working out which type of treatment is going to suit which patient and then in some cases carry on seeing that patient while they have that treatment. And uh, because it's a complex condition, things change, patients um, can relapse as well. So I'm certainly, certainly not suggesting neurologists shouldn't be wanting to own, own the own FND. They, I, you know, I think they should. I think everyone should want to be owning it. But I think that that's what we were seeing at the meeting and that's what we see with the research is that uh, a general consensus that this is a multidisciplinary problem. Yeah, yeah, um, and and I'm sure that through the course of um, the questions that that come up, and, and we will touch on this towards the end, 
you know, the biggest challenges that people face, no matter where they are in the world, um, is, is getting access to, to services. Um, in fact, yeah. we had one, one participant in one of our earlier webinars who was from, from Israel um, and, and was completely struggling to, to find um, any examples. But are there, are there countries that you've, you've seen that are starting to, to spring up um, you know, apart from the US and, and the UK and, and say the Netherlands, but are there other pockets of of interest that's emerging that again might be helpful for our our groups to know about? Yeah, I've yeah, as well Selma Abeck is a very is one of the world's leading researchers in F and D. She's a neurologist in now in Bern. She was in Geneva, so she has um, building quite a large service there in Switzerland. Um I was over over February. I went to Slo I went to Slovakia, where um, I was invited to speak to um, a lot of physiotherapists about FND. There's a good, a really good service in the Czech Republic, and these were the these were neurologists in Slovakia. There's one in Madrid, Isabel Perez, a neurologist who trained with Mark Edwards. Um, those are just ones off the top of my head. Roger Schmidt in uh, in Germany. So. Uh, Beatrice Garcin in Paris. So I think we're seeing uh, a definite sort of spread and, and you know, really good centres and, and, and great leadership as well in those centres from, uh, from the people involved. Yeah, okay, that's great. Well, what we'll do now is we'll, we'll move over. There's been quite a few questions already popping through, as I'm sure you're seeing. So we'll, we'll start to take some of these questions now. Um, Amelia has, has asked, is there a link between people who have had general anaesthetic and <clears throat> or worsening of FND symptoms? Yeah, yes is the, is the answer, but you've got to be careful about this because it's not that people with FND, people with FND can uh, and should have general anaesthetics if they need them. Um, but what you need to be careful of is we know from, from studies of both patients with uh, acute functional limb weakness and functional movement disorders, that general anaesthesia is a recorded trigger in, those pa in about 5% of those patients. And similarly, there are patients with dissociative attacks who um, have, uh, have had their first attack when coming round from a general anaesthetic. And the reason for that is not to do with allergy to anaesthetic or uh, anything like that. It's really to do with the effect the effect of having a of general anaesthetic and the way that it makes you feel when you're coming around. Patients feel groggy, they might be in pain, it's disorienting, uh, it's, uh, yeah, and it's something about that experience that triggers a dissociative um, feeling in many patients. So, that, so dissociation means a feeling of disconnection from your body or a feeling of disconnection from the world around you. And we know that actually in about half of patients where they have FND coming on very suddenly that they're having these dissociative experiences. So my, when I'm asked about that by patients and other health professionals, I would all say, yes, have your anaesthetic, but just be, be aware that the symptoms might occur. And the, and the biggest risk there is really that other health professionals don't know what they're dealing with. They think the person's having a stroke. They think they're having an epileptic seizure, and the person with FND gets inappropriate treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question here. Um, I think this is this is a, a great one for, <laughs> on so many levels. But but Julie's asked, can you get better yourself with positive thinking? Well, okay. Um, hmm. I think you know, nobody can think positively all the time. Nobody wants to either. I'm not, I'm not sure it's necessarily about just positive thinking. I would say it's more about having a good and deep understanding of the condition that's more important. I think someone, you know, someone just saying, oh, you've got to think positively all the time um, is not that helpful. But I think there, when you have... A really good understanding of the condition that enables you to come up with if you know, it's such a miserable thing to have that if 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 your understanding of it and you've learned things from perhaps a therapist or somebody else 
that enables you to come up with ideas that can combat very negative thoughts when you have them. So if you're having thoughts like, oh my God, am I ever going to get better? Am I going to get worse? Why do I keep having relapses? If you're able then to say, well, hang on a minute, um, I do keep having relapses, but you know what? This relapse isn't quite as bad as the last one. Uh, I'm not feeling as anxious about what's going on. Um, those are, in a way, positive th positive thinking, aren't they? But they're, it's not just sort of bland, oh, I'm going to feel positive about it and everything will be all right. That certainly doesn't help, I don't think. Yeah, it could set the wrong expectation in people, I think, is, is the yeah. issue, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, another question um, here, this one from, um, from Sally. Um, she said that she's, she's joined this webinar hoping to hear something that helps uh, as she finds it so difficult to know where to turn. Um, do you think that FND can be triggered by trauma that occurred 15 years ago but was never addressed? Uh, yes, I think that can happen. Um, and it's been a central sort of issue actually in FND because for a long time, particularly over the 20th century, a lot of health professionals would think that that's the only way that FND happens. Um, but what we've learned, I think, in the last 10 or 15 years is that whilst uh, traumatic events that happen to people can be very relevant to some individuals, they're very important, but to others, they're not relevant at all. And the, the person, some people get, can become quite distressed actually by health professionals insisting that they must have had some form of trauma. If you put that to one side, there are definitely patients who've had a very traumatic event, sometimes in childhood, adolescence, which they couldn't really process at the time. Something reminds them of that trauma later on. They feel distressed. And it's not that there's necessarily a direct connection between the trauma and what the symptom, but in that general state of distress, um, they become more vulnerable to FND. They become more vulnerable to dissociation um, and a sort of loss of control of their body, particularly if they've had uh, physical injury or physical trauma as the, as the event. So it's a tricky one. Uh, it's like saying, does smoking cause um, heart disease? Well, yes, but there's plenty of people with heart disease who've never smoked. And uh, so if they have smoked, it's important to talk about it. But if they haven't, one doesn't, you shouldn't make a big thing of it. Mm. Yeah. Um, another question here. This one, and this one, kind of goes back to the uh, to the anaesthetic one in, in a way. But but Christine has asked here. She said, um, "My husband needs an operation on his knee. The hospital have cancelled his operation twice now, as they don't think it's safe to operate, as they don't have any understanding of FND and are not confident in operating, which she's finding obviously very frustrating." Um, <laughs> But I, I know, again, from my from my own personal experience with my wife, who was about to have an operation, they didn't have a high dependency unit that they felt was important um, in order to support her through the operation. Mm. What <laughs> what can somebody do in in this kind of situation where um, essentially, you know, they require surgery, but it's not being done for them because of FND? Yeah, tricky one. I think. Yeah, maybe that's something we need someone I or someone else needs to provide information about. But because it's all about giving, I think that when it's quite difficult giving practice health health professionals confidence in this diagnosis because it's all very well for me to say, well, if there's a if there's a dissociative seizure, it's okay. You don't need to give the person diazepam. You just need to wait, be calm. In fact, the more of a fuss you make around it, actually, it will make things worse. It's okay for me to say that, but then I can tell the difference between a dissociative seizure and an epileptic seizure, whereas those healthcare staff may not be able to. So, so I think it's if if you if it's possible, I would try and ask your neurologist to contact the surgeons and do it that way. So I often find myself writing to surgeons to explain these sorts of things. The other issue here, the other reason why sometimes surgery isn't done is not so much of the concern about neurological symptoms around the procedure. It's more that, that some people with FND are particularly vulnerable to general complications of surgery because they've got a body that's sensitized to pain, 
or fatigue. Um, there probably there possibly is in some people, well, there definitely is in some people, a higher risk of surgical complications of pain. So if in an and that's obviously more relevant where it's a borderline decision whether surgery should be done or not. So that's another reason, which is sometimes legitimate, actually, why surgery is not done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, we all know surgery always carries a risk. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, that can be exaggerated and exacerbated when you're suffering from FND. Um, Sarah has asked a, an interesting question here. Um, from what I've read, a lot of people with this diagnosis also have or have had uh, vitamin and mineral deficiencies, B12, iron, etc., and undiagnosed intestinal issues, malabsorption issues for many years. With that in mind, has there been any research in the effects of the microbiome on FND, FMD? Okay, so, well, any, any neurologist should know that um, if you have a patient with neurological symptoms, it's important to think particularly about B12 deficiency um, and measure that. The B12 deficiency is quite common, can, cause, can contribute to neurological symptoms. Any kind of uh, medical problem makes someone vulnerable to FND. So whether they've got migraine, if you've got epilepsy, you've got much higher rate, rate of having dissociative attacks. I have many patients, for example, who have MS and also have FND, and they've partly got FND because they've got MS. So it's, it's important to always think, just because someone's got FND, the, the, the question should always be asked, well, what else might they have that might be making them vulnerable? I don't think there's anything special about the vitamins and minerals, particularly other than generally thinking about um, a healthy diet. I think there, uh, there is a lot of interest in the microbiome for those people. That's, that's the, you know, what kind of um, bacteria do you have living in your bowel? And uh, some really interesting work suggesting how those bacteria and uh, can actually influence your body and actually have a remote influence on your on your physical, neurological, mental health. Um, so there is something in that. There's no specific research in related to FND though in the microbiome at the moment is the bottom yep. line. Yep, okay. Um, Marcus has got a question here. Um, how would you educate some family and relative members who appear cynical? Um, and then he's also asked a follow-up question to that, which relates to the 2017 conference and whether whether any of that will ever get published. But uh, I think we'll, we'll deal with the first one for, first of all, how to educate family members um, who were who were cynical. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me because you're slowing down at times, Matt, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm still guessing you, so hopefully everyone's got me okay. Um, yes, yeah, a really great question, that. I think it's underestimated how often, how difficult it is for many patients, they go and see the doctor, even when that con even when that conversation's gone well and the person is starting to get their head around FND, they then have to go home, talk to family and friends, and explain what they've got. And nobody's heard of this condition. And if you start looking up, you say, "Well, here's a condition you can't see on a scan, which has a which has a history that is difficult and very difficult for patients and doctors to." Um, get to grips with, where people have for many years over, probably, you know, overemphasized the role of psychological factors. Um, these, are, these are very difficult things. And you've got symptoms which also vary sometimes according to whether someone is noticing them or not. So someone sometimes might have a weak leg and other times their, their leg might be much better. Um, I, think, I think it's about going through the same sort of process of information that hopefully you've, you've had from the person making the diagnosis and saying, look, this is a common condition. It's the second commonest reason to see a neurologist. Uh, it's a diagnosis that we make positively. It's not made just because the scans and tests are normal. That's not how you make uh, this diagnosis at all. Um, that we actually understand quite a lot about how it works and, and personalizing that information um, to, to you is very important and seeing how that 
how your story might be relevant and how this thing develops. So obviously information on the on the internet and FND Hope and other charities and the website I've made hopefully helps a bit as well to see that this is not that rare a thing. Lots of people have it. Um, it's incredibly important to get family, close family and friends on side with this condition. If they are cynical, my experience is it's really hard for people to make progress. Yeah. So great. So a great question. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Marcus, for asking that. Um, and, and, and the follow up from Alison, um, is this illness forever or, or can you recover with a please at the end of that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I know. And everyone wants to know the answer to that. And the answer is that, that what I often say, find myself saying is, I don't know. You're, you know, and, and, and everyone's different. Everyone has a different set of circumstances. Some people have many, many obstacles to recovery in terms of their medical history, how long they've had the problem for. Uh, some people have less, but even then, it's very hard to predict that on an individual basis. But what I would say is that however long you've had this condition for, you've always got, there's always the potential for improvement. And I wouldn't, Try not to let people take that away from you. And at the same time, you've also got to try and learn to live with it and not get too angry and frustrated with the fact that your body's not working or that you'll have unpredictable uh, events. And it's really hard to make that balance, I know. Um, so, but I do think it's important not, to, sometimes people are tempted to say, oh, this is a chronic condition. You have to learn to live with it. This is it. I wouldn't say that to anyone because I think you've got, there is the potential for improvement. You never know how things might turn out. So I hope that, I hope that answers that question. Yeah. Um, I have a question here from Sherry. Um, she said, Dr. Stone, in your opinion, what would be the main reason that neurology and psychiatry and psychology are not taking responsibility for treatment? I was diagnosed by a neurologist who basically said there is nothing more that I can do for you <clears throat> the psychiatrist uh, and then where are we in Canada with specialists that are aware of FND? <laughs> it's a really common story I'm afraid and we you know I mean that's and that was the story almost everywhere I would say uh, 20, 15 years ago so it's at least there are some places where that doesn't ha uh, happens less um, so I'm gonna go to the answer, answer. but what, what's the main reason they're not taking responsibility? I think it's to do with training. Uh, so neurologists are often not trained in this. Uh, they are now in the UK and, you know, our, our trainees in Edinburgh get lots of training and they really, I think, are, are, are good at seeing people with FND. So it's about training and it's about providing, if you provide research, particularly research, research that demonstrates what the mechanisms of this condition are, how to make a positive diagnosis, and particularly if you can demonstrate treat that treatments are effective, that makes a big difference, I think. So that people will say, well, actually, this is a, it's not acceptable to tell a patient there's nothing I can do for you because we have randomised trial evidence that there is treatments that can help, and they're not just they're not just in the psychological domain, although that's important. Um, they're physiotherapy. The multidisciplinary treatment. So, people, doctors, and other health professionals saying that, I'm afraid of not keeping up with where we are with research in FND. And we have to, you know, it's. I mean, we can't expect patients newly diagnosed to be demanding treatment they don't know about. But that's potentially where we have to start going with this. I think that. Um, patients become informed and, uh, and tell health professionals look I've I would like to have specific physiotherapy or I would like to have um, I would like to see a psychologist who understands dissociative seizures hmm. easier said than done and in many places those people are not available but you can still help educate I think many health professionals are willing to learn and we have articles and training materials for them to find out about this and many of the treatments are really very similar and ha have a lot of similarities to what they're already familiar with I would say hmm. okay um, 
Jennifer has asked a question uh, and somebody else on Facebook has asked a, a, a related question to this. I'll try and combine the, the, the two, but Jennifer has asked, is there a definite link between F and D and fibromyalgia? Uh, and a similar question that I've seen on Facebook was, does, does fibromyalgia or ME precede FND or, or the other way around? Yeah. Well, the answer is yes, there is a definite link, and yes, they can proceed or follow. So what we're dealing with here is these are all functional disorders. They're all disorders of abnormal functioning of the nervous system. There's, there's other perspectives to them as well, but that's one very important way, thing that they all have in common. And um, evidence shows that patients who have, uh, for example, functional motor disorders like a weak arm and leg, probably about, about 60 to 70% of them also have chronic pain somewhere in their body and probably around 30-40% have widespread pain that could be said to be fibromyalgia. That's often not specifically diagnosed, uh, but, but very common. Um, we, I, I see many patients who start off with fibromyalgia or persistent fatigue states and then gradually over time and later on in their illness develop FND and you definitely and you see it the other way around. We need that they're all functional disorders. So we need a sort of on our language isn't quite right here in terms of the way that we speak about these things, but they 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 are all overlapping conditions. So just as uh, patients will often have irritable bowel syndrome or um, overactive bladder. Those are also functional disorders. And it's sometimes very helpful to be able to connect these things up and, and for the person to see that they actually have one condition, a functional disorder, which has uh, part, part of which is presenting with neurological symptoms, that's the FND, with pain, that's the fibromyalgia, et cetera. So I, that's what I endeavor to um, explain to people in that situation. Okay, okay. I've uh, um, got a question here from Audrey, um, she's asked, do you know anything uh, in regards to type 1 diabetes and the effect on FND? Um, I don't think there's a, there's not a specific effect, but it's similar to the previous question, which is that what, what's the relationship between these sort of medical conditions and FND? And the answer is that any medical condition makes you vulnerable to FND or to other functional disorders. I, I saw a patient this week with who's got type 1 diabetes and FND. And having diabetes is, you know, can be miserable. And it also makes you vulnerable to fatigue. It makes you vulnerable to having, if you have hypos, you have the experience of losing control, which can then get repeated uh, in FND. So it's that, it's that sort of relationship. It's not an absolutely direct one, but it's, it's the experience of illness that changes the nervous system, makes you vulnerable. Mm. Okay. Uh, Julie's question here is, is it common for FND to come and go like an MS relapse? Yeah, really common. I mean, so common that I would say that's... When I'm talking to patients who've, who've got limb weakness and we're trying to, and they're in a situation where they're undergoing rehabilitation or treatment and they're doing well, I'm afraid I'm always a bit of a misery guts and saying, well, actually, this is fantastic, but you know, this is a condition that does tend to relapse. But I think when people learn about the condition, learn through treatment how to manage it, they manage their relapses better, hopefully and their, their relapses become less severe and less long-lasting. But it's very much a fluctuating, relapsing condition. It's one of the very difficult things about it for people to cope with, because they, you know, they work very hard and they get better, and then it, they often feel like they're back to square one again. Um, although it isn't necessarily back to square one. When it, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting. I'm just looking through, again, the, the, the comments in, in Facebook here. Um, and a few people are asking very similar questions in relation to other other conditions. You know, if they have a, an infection or a, or a cold, um, it's it's making their FND worse. Um, yeah. I think what you're saying there is in is in general that any medical condition, be it the simple fact of having a, a cold or or something more serious than that, 
um, is obviously not going to be sympathetic towards your F and D. It is, no. has a potential to make things work. And that's something that we also see, in, you know, people with MS or, or people with uh, you know epilepsy. So, and then maybe as well, but having if you have F and D or chronic, if you haven't had it for a while and you're been unwell and fatigued, your immune system may have changed as well slightly because you've not been uh, you're not as healthy. Um, so it might be harder to fight off colds. Hmm. Um, Candice has asked a question. It's a bit difficult for you to give um, specifics on this one. Um, but she's saying that she vomits through seizures and now having trouble swallowing solids. Um, I can easily vomit at most times. I'm on baclofen. Oh, sorry, baclofen. Um, is this a common sign of FND and is there anything that can be done about it? Um, it's not a specific sign of FND uh, vomiting. So you can, it, again, we're back to sort of difficulties of what we call different things. There are lots, there are a range of uh, functional disorders which affect the gastrointestinal tract. The most common one is irritable bowel, where people get constipation and alternating uh, diarrhea and constipation, abdominal pain. But people, but some people also have esophageal spasm as part of a functional disorder that's called fun, uh, functional dyspepsia. Um, some people have a condition which has been called cyclical vomiting. Um, that, common, that links a bit into migraine, but I think it's commonly part of a functional bowel disorder. Um, so if someone's telling me they vomit all the time, that's not specifically part of FND, but I would recognize that connection. I would have to, personally, I would then have to work with a gastroenterologist to understand the vomiting, make sure that there isn't another cause of it. But again, I think these things are quite, it's a, it's, it's often is a positive diagnosis that um, should not be a diagnosis of exclusion, should have fit to a familiar pattern of symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just looking. Uh, Lynn's got a question here. This this relates to um, functional MRIs, and we're actually in the webinar just before this one with with Catherine Lefebvre. We're talking about this. Um, but Lynn has asked: Has there been any study where a scan is done whilst the patient is asked to move, weak limbs, uh, speech, memory problems, etc., to see what the brain is, is doing? Yeah, great question. And the answer is yes, they have. There's probably about 20 of those sorts of studies, or 25, I would say. And what what's, and although it's difficult to interpret all of them because they're d done in a different way, but I think it's fairly clear that what they what that those scans and these are we're talking here about functional brain imaging scans. So if you do a structural scan, just looking at the structure of the brain, uh, that's normal uh, or at least um, it's normal in individuals if you put them all together there might be subtle changes but what but what we do see the most interesting changes are in functional brain scans and those are scans where bits of the brain light up if you're doing things and for those for those studies what the, i think the most interesting thing for other for health professionals perhaps is to demonstrate that People with FND, when they're trying to move their weak limb, for example, the signals that we get in the brain look different to someone who's pretending to have a weak limb. So different parts of the brain light up. Um, and it's been also interesting to see whether, so, so we can actually see these, this abnormal functioning of the nervous system on functional brain imaging. And we also see in doing that, that that lots of different parts of the brain are involved. So whereas in the past, doctors had this big emphasis on emotion and psychological factors, uh, we do see that in some of these studies, that, the, that people are trying to move their limbs, emotional centers are being activated. Um, but what we also see are parallels to conditions like phantom limb pain, where people feel that a limb is still there even though it isn't. Whereas a lot of people with FND feel as if the, their limb isn't there, even though it is. So it's a sort of opposite way around. So I think brain functional brain imaging has done a lot to help bring FND back into neurology to help people see there is, there is a neurobiology of FND, which is complementary to understanding 
other vulnerabilities and, and existing ideas about it. Hmm. No, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating topic and, and the whole area of neuroscience as well that, that goes along with that. But it's, it's, it's great to start to see some of this um, strong evidence um, just becoming more more available in, in, in the research and just out there. So uh, uh, it's great to see. Um, getting a few questions here, again, I'm just going to try and wrap a couple uh, or more questions on, on this topic, but medication um, is coming up a, a number of times here. Uh, I guess people are interested on, on your thoughts about medication and the helpfulness in treating FND. Um, I, I know that there's been a couple of people who have asked uh, one in particular was saying that can the medication make the non-epileptic attack disorders worse? Um, someone else has said, you know, is it true that there is no medication that can treat FND? So what's what's your views around this whole topic of medication and how helpful can it be? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any particularly good evidence for medication helping the sort of neurological symptoms of FND themselves. So I don't know whether any medication that helps limb weakness specifically or tremor or jerky movements. Um, there's a little bit of evidence to suggest that some types of so-called SSRI that's, uh, and medicines used to treat, that are used to treat depression, anxiety, but are used generally in neurology and psychiatry. They may be helpful for dissociative attacks, but we're, not, we're just not there yet. There's not enough, not enough studies. Usually where I'm using medication, it's because patients with FND, as, as anybody who's listening to this and has it will know, most people, it's not just a neurological symptom. There's pain, there might be sleep disturbance, there might be bad migraine, uh, there might be problems with anxiety, low mood. And for those symptoms, we have much better evidence for some medications. Um, I'm not necessarily a big fan of lots of medication. I'm not sure that medication is sort of the answer to problems, but I think they can be helpful, used carefully, and they can help people um, better able to benefit from rehabilitation techniques, which I think are more uh, central to the to the treatment. So it's it would be it would be great if there was a pill for FND, which maybe it would go away, but there isn't. And I actually have to say I spend quite a lot of time reducing and stopping medication in patients more than probably more than starting them. Yeah, um, I mean, we, we know from our own patient groups um, when people are describing the amount of medication that they're on and, and it's been prescribed for, for very valid reasons by their GP. Um, we know that. But the question is, how helpful is it actually being? Um, if, if, if somebody I mean, doesn't think... put themselves in a situation where they think they're taking a lot of medication and they believe it's not doing any good for them, or they're not really getting any benefits. What would your advice? Should they go back to their GP and, and have that discussion with them in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. I think we have to be very careful with this discussion of medication because there are some medications out there that people will be on that they really must be on and must stay on and are and are essential for them. And there are some medications that if they do want to stop them, they need to do that in a certain way, slowly and with individual advice. Um, so it's important not to just start and stop medications. It can be quite dangerous to do that. So you always get medical advice. Yeah. Um, um, moving on, a uh, question here. Where a person has had a virus prior to the onset of FND, could the blood-brain barrier be compromised um, as a vulnerability? Sorry. Could the blood-brain barrier be compromised in vulnerability to FND? Okay, interesting question. I think when you, I mean, when you have a virus, all of us will have had flu at some time in our lives where we have a temperature and you know that feeling you get when you have terrible flu where you just want to shut down and you're, you become exhausted. And people are very interested in that, in what's going on when that happens. You know, where does all that fatigue come from uh, in flu? It's your body's sort of protective mechanism in some ways. Um, and there is, it is true, there is some compromise of the blood-brain barrier, and there's a whole raft of different things that happen in the immune system. I think in, F, in most people with FND, where they've had a viral trigger, what happens is that the is that the viral illness comes and it goes, and the person essentially that illness has gone, and the blood-brain barrier is okay again. 
but the the illness has left its mark and it's triggered the trigger the illness a bit like um just you've got a ball at the top of a hill and you just touch it it doesn't it doesn't need necessarily much of a touch and sometimes people need a, a big touch sometimes a little and then it's rolling all by itself even though the, the even without anyone touching it so it's 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 best to think of these sort of initial events i think as triggering events which have come and gone it's the same story for physical injury if you've had a, some people have a knock to the head or an injury to a limb um you know the soft tissue injury heals but the symptoms carry on um that's that's the way i tend to think of it because if you and it's quite important that because if you thought that the blood brain barrier was still very leaky and you think well what can you do about that you know and is that really still causing my fnd i don't think there's any evidence that that's the case and it's it's a it's a more hopeful message as well to think well actually it's not actually due to damage anymore or something that i've got that i can't do anything about potentially whereas at least did difficult as it is to improve FND at least there is a potential route to try and retrain your brain try and get control back I know that isn't always possible yeah um, Rebecca has uh, pointed out here she said that diet has been incredible for reducing her seizures um, she's asked you know any further unvited advice on this and how is it working are there any other natural things i can try without medication so what's what's been your experience in terms of research in, on the effect of diet and fnd diet. yeah i don't think there has been much research on diet it's actually quite it's quite difficult doing dietary research and the trouble with fnd is that it because of the nature of the condition you're dealing with a problem where there's a so, the software has gone wrong in your brain it is possible to i think what can happen is that if someone at the same time as they start to understand their condition feel that they want to do something about it find a way to make themselves feel better and certainly changing your diet can do that so if, you know various things people do with their diet and getting control of their uh what they're eating definitely can make you feel better it can be part of that feeling control so when you then improve is that because of the specific changes you made in your diet or is it because you changed your diet you felt better you felt more in control of what was going on i think it's a very complex area it's going to be difficult to do research on i have no doubt that i and i meet patients as well who change their diet they feel that that's the thing that helped their seizures but i think it's probably more it's it's happening through a quite a complex mechanism that i think hmm well that's interesting that that, that opens up the area of um the placebo effect um yeah which is which is not which is not to denigrate it i mean i think the placebo effect is a fantastic thing because if it works it, yeah. it works um but do you think there is um that aspect um or potential within uh, functional treatment of functional disorders where um looking at some of the things around the placebo can actually make a positive difference yeah. Well, the, so the, the really fascinating thing about the placebo effect is in the last 10 or 15 years, we've discovered that, that the placebo effect also has a biology. So people have been amazed when they've done clinical trials of conditions like Parkinson's disease and epilepsy, uh, seeing how well patients with those conditions responded to placebo. I think, well, how is it possible that a placebo just a sugar pill is reducing epileptic seizures and it's reducing the symptoms of parkinson's disease and it's possible because a placebo is not just an inactive so if someone is taking something that they think might help them it activates various chemicals in your brain that will actually um uh, emit it will actually imitate the kind of chemicals that you need to get better so um they, so people who have placebo along with uh, morphine, for example, when you, if you keep doing placebo with morphine and then you take the morphine away, the placebo activates morphine in your brain. It's actually the perfect sort of drug cheat, to be honest. Um, so, so we need to have a different way of thinking about how these things work and about the fact that everyone is susceptible to these effects. We need to work out what the mechanisms are so that we can use them in a transparent way 
and that we're not because nobody well i'm certainly not interested in anything that is dis, in the least bit deceptive or uh, i want everything to be honest and transparent with patients so we had a we had a fantastic lecture on that our um, conference by an Italian uh, neuroscientist called Fabrizio Benedetti. He's written a book about that. He's written a book about how how we might take this forward about using this you know this age old method to try and get people better. How does it work? Um, many many challenges ahead there. I think. Mm, yes, yes. I mean, the the research is always the problem, isn't it? To justify it and. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, a question here from Stephanie. Um, it's a little bit detailed, so I'll, I'll try and summarize if I can. If you have had traumatic events in your childhood and teenage years and have CBT, and you have a great and well working toolbox of mindfulness skills and ways to cope, and then you get FND years later. However, between these, you have had daily chronic migraines with aura as well as um, women's issues um, concurrently for at least six months prior to FND. Is it possible that the migraines themselves or the ho hormones cause the FND? Yeah. So it's a good question. So what it's saying is this is somebody who's had traumatic events and then they've also had really bad migraine and other sort of hormone gynae issues. What's caused it is the question. And I think the, the answer is, that many, most people of FND have complex, what we call multifactorial cause, causation for their condition. So it's, you know, everybody wants to know what's caused it. It's not always possible to, to know the answer to that. And if someone's got really bad migraine and then they get FND, it's, li li and it's likely that the migraine is the, most, is the most important thing at that point. And it often gets ignored by people, by health professionals, who are sometimes more interested in talking about the trauma. That's not to say the trauma might not be relevant, um, but I, you know I, uh, that story, that question chimes with a lot of patients I meet who have gone through therapy for adverse experience, do feel that they've um, spent a lot of time on that, and get pretty upset if people say, well, hang on a minute, this is all related to your adverse child experience. You know, it's Sometimes it is a bit, to be honest, but sometimes it isn't. We need to be, have a flexible approach to um, risk factors for FND that include adverse events, but also include migraine, include other health problems. You know, mig you know, mi migraine is quite interesting because you know, I have quite bad migraine, but that also associates with other functional disorders. You could argue that migraine itself is a, is a, is a functional disorder. So I don't know the answer for for, um, uh, for the person who asked the question, that would take some time to figure out. And it might be that nobody can figure that out. But I would, you, you would encourage an openness and flexibility in the health professional trying to help someone figure that out, I think is what, what I would hope for. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are kind of running up uh, out, of, out of time. So if people have got any questions, and I apologise if we're, we're not going to get through all of the questions, but... But keep them coming. We'll try and, and get through as many as we can. Um, there's one here from, and I'm probably going to pronounce her name incorrectly, but Thea. Um, she's gone into quite a bit of detail there, but she, she did get a diagnosis of FND in March this year by her neurologist who then retired um, and, and now is, is, is left on her own. So her question is, is how does she get... Re refer to an FND specialist? Well, it's, I guess it, I mean, it depends what country and healthcare system you're in, but in the UK, you would, you've, you, it, whoever retires, you should have your GP. Um, you should be able to say, look, I need some help with my symptoms. Can you refer me back to another neurologist? Can you, is there a team somewhere uh, that I can be referred to, or somebody with with some um, expertise in this condition. Sorry, can you still hear me? Yep, you uh, still hear your sign yeah. coming out. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it's, a, I mean, people patients shouldn't have to be fighting for you know to to be seen and to see someone. It should just happen. I know, but sometimes it does require if you can. Be patiently uh, enthusiastic with your GP and 
uh, say, look, you're very keen on having treatment. What can I do to help and see what happens would be my advice there. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's that's good advice. And you still and hear I, me? Yeah, I can still hear you. Um, and I'm seeing other people asking similar questions about how to uh, encourage their GPs to be more aware of, of, of FND. Um, and I think that is still a common problem where people are seeing um, the GPs and, and not being yeah. uh, given the correct answers. But I, I think one of the things, because it's coming up quite a, a number of times, and, and, and John, feel free to, to chip in as well, but we, we do find people get positive experience when they're able to take some material with them uh, yeah. to an appointment that does explain what FND is. And yeah. so on the FND website, there's, there's information. But John, I know that obviously you have the neurosymptoms.org website. Is there anything else that you could advise people that they should do when they go and see professionals? Yeah, I think I, think I would. That is worth... Uh, I mean, I've... I've tried to do on my website is for each symptom if, if you've got limb weakness or you've got seizures or you've got uh, tremor there's, there's a downloadable fact sheet and I think printing that off taking it to your appointment and saying look here's a fact sheet written by a neurologist in Edinburgh this is what I've got um, and I would like more help for it and you know if you've got you know can you can we find a physiotherapist who can help me? And there's also, there's a very um, long detailed uh, document describing the physiotherapy for functional motor disorders on there. So if you've got movement disorder or limb weakness, you could print that off. Say, look, I don't want to be a pest, but have you seen, would, you, would this um, article be of interest to you in helping me with my condition? I would hope that when they read the article, they see that this that we that there's a lots of sort of common sense stuff in there, hopefully, which is it's not sort of wacky. Uh, it's pretty close to a lot of the ways that they treat and approach many other neurological, physical conditions, or in the case of seizures, psychological therapies, very close, to, for example, to how you would treat someone with panic attacks. Um, so yeah, I think that's good advice actually. Print something off, take it, try and be not try not to be too frustrated with health professionals who don't understand your condition. I know that's, that seems strange advice, but um, we're, we you know we are working on them. We're I think and and health professionals are willing to be interested, and particularly trainees are willing to be interested. So I think we'll get there. Well, things will improve. I'm hopeful on that front. <laughs> Um, we have, um, we'll make this the second to last question. This one's from Joe, um, and this is, this is an interesting one. Um, she said, is there any specific treatment available or advice for the cognitive symptoms of FND, please? Uh, there is no physical or mental trauma that may have triggered <coughs> FND. My husband had FND diagnosed after 18 months to two years of tests but does not have any pain or seizures. Um, he said mental health assessments, um, with there being any other issues prior to the conditions. Yeah. Um, yeah, so obviously for someone who's just suffering the cognitive symptoms, yeah. um, is that FND without the other aspects? Yeah, well, I'd say I think it is FND. It's been a kind of ignored topic. Again, it's a bit like pain. You, co you know, cognitive symptoms are really common. They're so common that if people don't have them at all, I, I, you know, I always double check, are you sure? Because it's so, it's so common. Uh, and there are some people whose main problem is cognition. And that they, uh, they come to the clinic with, quite, with, with a range of different severities of problems, some of which are... Kind of amplification of, of normal symptoms that, that we all have but happening all the time so constantly losing things all day long and uh forgetting forgetting where they are in conversations and those sort of things are quite distressing and they make people wonder if they're getting demented we can actually positively diagnose i think many patients with functional cognitive disorders based on some of the similar principles that we use for movement disorders such as limb weakness by showing that sometimes their memory is working very well and sometimes it's very bad we've actually written some um i've written an article on that on functional cognitive disorders which i'm happy to share with anyone um 
there's a lot of there's some interesting work going on in um, Sheffield. Marcus Roiber's group are doing on functional cognitive disorder. It's quite a big problem out there. Um, lots of people go to memory clicks and are just told, well, good news, you don't have dementia. That, but just like FND, they're not told what they do have or what to do about it. There, there's some links on the, I've got, there's a page on cognitive symptoms on my website. There's some links to some, some quite useful tips that uh, Laura McWhirter, uh, a colleague I work with here in Edinburgh, wrote about that. And then there's a very specific subgroup of people who get much more profound memory problems where they lose a whole chunk of time and they lose you know, weeks or sometimes months or even years um, of time. And that's, that's a slightly separate problem that needs a probably different approach. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last question then, uh, and this one from Dawn. What future research projects are you going to be involved in? Yeah, thanks, Dawn. Um, well, uh, the biggest and most exciting project that is coming we're starting later this year is led by Glenn Nielsen a uh, physiotherapist in St George's who with a with a group of us across the UK has was successfully applied for uh, funding for a, a multi-center randomized controlled trial of specific physiotherapy for FND for patients with symptoms of weakness, tremor, gait problems. Um, so that is going to be a challenge to do but we are I'm really looking forward it's going to be a really exciting uh, trial we're going to uh, recruit hopefully several hundred patients it will be the biggest trial in FN in FND motor symptoms by by a country mile actually Glenn's is one of the other but it is one of the other biggest and um, so I think it's we really need this to demonstrate that we do have treatments that can help at least some people with FND and help more than conventional treatments. And we're gonna need the support of neurologists and also patients to do this trial. Um, I don't know what the answer will be. It may be that we're wrong and it's not, <laughs> and that the specific therapy isn't better, but we, we will find out and that's very exciting. So we're doing that. I've got many, many projects on the go, more than I should probably. I probably need to do <laughs> less, but I, yeah, I need to slow it down. Um, but there's lots of exciting developments with, um, uh, I think some of you might have heard Ingrid's uh, webinar with FND Hope, looking at patients with bladder symptoms. Um, we've got the results of the CODE trial coming out, um, hopefully in the next year or so, to, to see what evidence do we have to treat dissociative non-epileptic attacks. So I think we are moving to a much better and more recognized level of evidence here um, these these trials are expensive they've been funded by the national institute of health research for you know over a million pounds which is not which is not coming to me or to glenn but that's but that's how much it costs to to run a large trial and it's great that these organizations are recognizing fnd as a thing that should be funded mm. okay well i think that's a perfect time on, on such a positive note to to wind up and, and finish off um, there are loads of people in, in the Facebook uh, comment section expressing the, the gratitude to you, John. Um, I'm really thanks, appreciate folks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, so I'd like to say a special thank you for you for making the time tonight. It's been most valuable. It's great to talk to you again. Um, to everybody that's attended, thank you. Thank you for all of your great questions. Apologies to those that we weren't able to get to. Uh, there was just so many, I, I just couldn't get to them all. But but thank you all very much once again. Yeah, and yeah, and and just to echo my thanks to FND Hope and the other patient organisations. You're making a, a tremendous difference, I think, to the whole uh, field. I don't think some of you realise how much difference this is going, this is making, both to patients, but also to things like uh, letting government know that this is a real condition that affects many, many thousands of people. Um, so it's something to really celebrate today, I think, particularly. Yeah, Thank you. absolutely. Yeah. Thanks again, John. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.